like that.
have everybody try to get a seat. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody this afternoon, this evening, um, on behalf of uh, Lindsay and JP and, and the, the rest of the family. Um, today we're going to have, actually tonight we're going to have two services. Uh, this is uh, Deacon Michael from Our Lady Hope Catholic Church. He's going to do the first part of our service. Thank you, Deacon. And then uh, it's going to be followed up by Mark's 5B. So there'll be a little bit of a break. I'll come up and get you followed up. Uh, and there again, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. And uh, I'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, please be seated. <laughs> and uh, I want to certainly uh, express my condolences. Is there a microphone up there? Can you hear me back here? Can, you, can everyone hear me all right? All right. Uh, I know people say that, but sometimes you can't. This is Luke. I'm Deacon Michael Pettit from uh, Our Lady of Hope Catholic Church, and certainly on behalf of the parish and the Father Chris, who is our new pastor, offer our condolences at your loss of your father and your brother Thank you. and the, any family and friends that are here. Obviously, he was a well-loved man, because he was certainly it's one of the largest uh, crowds I've seen in a vigil memorial service. It's very nice. We'll begin our prayer then in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. My brothers and sisters, we believe that all the ties of friendship and affection which knit us as one throughout our lives do not unravel with death. Confident that God always remembers the good we have done and forgives our sins, let us pray asking God to gather John to himself. Lord our God, the death of our brother John recalls our human condition and the brevity of our lives on earth. But for those who believe in your love, death is not the end, nor does it destroy the bonds that you forge in our lives. We share the faith of your son's disciples and the hope of the children of God. Bring the light of Christ's resurrection to this time of testing and pain as we pray for John and those who love him, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We'll have a reading from Holy Scripture. The first reading is from a letter of John. See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a short responsorial psalm, and your response is, Lord, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. One thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze on the loveliness of the Lord and contemplate his temple. The Lord is my light and salvation. Hear, O Lord, the sound of my call. Have pity on me and answer me. Your presence, O Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. The Lord is my light and salvation. I believe that I shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord with courage. Be stout-hearted and wait for the Lord. And now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, 
he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed by my father Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I chose these two scriptures after speaking to John and <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay. I told you I was getting the <laughs> Especially after hearing a little bit about their father. You know, I sort of got called at the last minute from work. Uh, that he was a good man, obviously well loved, and that he was always doing something good for others. That gospel of Matthew is the one we keep our eyes on at this time. Because when it all is done. God knows who God is, and he knows who we are. So all our theology may fall apart when God reveals himself. We'll all find that we don't know anything about him. He knows who he is, but he's looking at us and what did we do? So he doesn't care how much theology you know about God, how much you can rattle off about God. But what did you do to the person sitting next to you, to your neighbor, to the person that you see that you know that you could help? That theology was confirmed in the conversion of St. Paul when he was knocked from his horse. He was out persecuting Christians and, and arresting them. And suddenly a bright light shone and got knocked from his horse. And here's this Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And that was the beginning of the whole theology of the mystical body of Christ, that we are all incorporated into Christ. John was baptized as a child or as an adult, I don't know, as a baby, received the Lord in Holy Eucharist, in Holy Communion, was confirmed with the Holy Spirit. He was incorporated into the body of Christ. He belongs to Christ. He was signed with the sign of the cross. He's Jesus' property, if you will. The Lord paid for us through his suffering and death on the cross. He purchased us. We're his. And it says, what will separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Who's going to condemn us? Will God the Father who sent his own son to die to redeem us? No. Will Jesus who shows the marks on his hands, is he going to condemn you? No. Why do you think I shed my blood for you? So what am I going to say? You know, send you off now? That would make no sense at all. And who else other than Satan can say anything about us? And he already lost the battle. He's the accuser. Just a little theology there when you feel guilty. And you feel beaten now. Well, look at you sitting in church being so holy and nice now. I know where you've been. I know what you did. That is never, ever coming from God. That is not from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is gentle. We'll say, you know, 
Maybe you should have given some water to that bank. Maybe you should have given a little money to that person on the street. Maybe you should have done a little better with your family. You know, we're all called to do something where we are. And if each one of us does what we can, as John must have done in his life, you know, they told me to give your shirt off his back. Well, that's exactly what it is. If somebody wants your shirt, give them your coat. Once you go a mile, go two. Some folks have this law in their heart. Some preach and teach and all that, but when you look at it, maybe they didn't quite do it. Whereas others may never say much about God or anything. You may not even think much about it. But these are sometimes the core people. You know, it's always a surprise to me. Because God, we're all going to be surprised at who's in heaven and what level of heaven they're in. You know, but that scripture, I think, is a thing that we can take comfort in. You know, we know he's alive in the Lord. And really where he is is where we're all going. So these times of loss are sorrow. There's no replacing your father or your brother. You know, that's an earthly loss. Certainly you're going to cry and that's okay. And think about him and talk about him and don't let anybody tell you not to. You know, as I said, I belong with being a deacon. I'm a registered nurse. And I remember attending a sin service on uh, grieving. So often friends will say, well, don't talk about him. You're going to cry. You know, mother lost a child 20 years ago. Don't talk about it because you'll cry. Go ahead and cry. Talk about them. Those people are alive. They're part of your life forever. So you want to talk about them. Your friends will let you. Okay. So we can take comfort in these words of Scripture, that John is with the Lord. The Lord, we ask, is forgiving and kind. Finally, we all throw ourselves on the mercy of God because there's not one of us that can stand and say, well, you know, I'm worthy, Lord. Let me on in. I did good. The minute you say that, you better hide. Whereas we hide ourselves in the mercy of Christ and the mercy of the Lord. And we trust in what he has promised. And as John partook of the body of Christ, that gives him life. Through the Holy Eucharist, through Holy Communion, he said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life because Jesus is the giver of life. His life within him and those who have partaken of his Holy Communion have life in them. And that life is eternal. That's the beginning of all life. Ordinarily at this time I would ask family members to speak, but I understand there's another minister who will be speaking later, and that's the time where people will share and, and, and tell their story. <coughs> so we'll continue with our prayer service now. Uh, your response here is, Lord, have mercy. <clears throat> Let us turn to Christ Jesus with confidence and faith in the power of his cross and resurrection. Risen Lord, pattern of our life forever, Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. Promise an image of what we shall be. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Son of God, who came to destroy sin and death. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Word of God, who delivered us from the fear of death. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Crucified Lord, forsaken in death, raised in glory. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, gentle shepherd, who bring rest to our souls. Give peace to John forever. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you bless those who mourn and are in pain. Bless John's family and friends who gather around him today. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And dear brothers and sisters, our true home is in heaven. Therefore, let us pray to our Heavenly Father as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Lord Jesus, our Redeemer, you willingly give your, gave yourself up to death, so that all might be saved and pass from death to life. We humbly ask you to comfort your servants in their grief, and to receive John into the arms of your mercy. You alone are the Holy One. You are mercy itself. By dying, you unlock the gates of life for those who believe in you. Forgive John his sins and grant him a place of happiness, light, and peace in the kingdom of your glory forever and ever. Anyone who knew John loved him and adored him. How many of you loved him? Put your hands up. How many of you adored him? Put your hands together. But you have to ask the question, don't you? What is love? So I ask kids, Lindsay, because they're smarter than adults. 
When my grandma got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandpa does it for her all the time, even though his hands got arthritis too. That's love, says eight-year-old Becky. Carl is five. Carl is smarter. Carl says love is when a girl puts on perfume and a guy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> John is nine. John says, love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. Kirsten is ten. She says, love is a lot of work. Being single is easier because you don't have to change diapers. But if I did fall in love, I would just phone my mother, have her come over for some coffee and diaper changing. But I like the last one the best. Eight-year-old David says, love will find you even if you're trying to hide from it. I've been trying to hide from it since I was five, but the girls keep finding me. And that's exactly what you're doing here tonight, isn't it? You came in here tonight to find John Schifani because you love him. Simple as that. The obituary can say whatever it likes. We're not talking about the achievements of a man in life. We're talking about how it felt to know him, what it was like to be in his presence. You're here because, quite simply, you loved him. So, let's open the floor and see if there's anyone here who would like to share just how much you love John, or what it was like to be in his presence. And a hush fell over the crowd. You don't have to come up here if you don't want to. You can stay where you are. You're coming up? Come on. I don't want to say what's going to come. All I can say is that he meant the world to me. He would give anything he could to anyone. And his heart was bigger than that. I don't want to cry because I want to be happy. Like I always said, the animals went to him before me, and I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? He's like, sorry, I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> and children, he loves so much. I could call him at any time and be like, Dad, I need you. And I just never met such a strong man that had such a kind heart. I, I don't even know what else to say, but how... I don't, how, how much you meant to me is like my best friend. And he taught me that stuff doesn't matter. It's what you do inside. And made me feel okay. Because I always felt like I, I always felt that I did, like with the animal thing, I did too much for nothing. Well, my dad's like, you treat others in the world and animals how you would want to be treated yourself. And where you go after this, because you don't leave with material things. You don't leave with money. You leave with what you've done on the earth for people, for animals, for children, for everything. And he made me at peace with it. He was never, he was never selfish. He was never, I just don't even know how to explain it. He would do anything for anyone. And I know there's a lot of people in here that have told me stories. And I just want you guys please to come up and speak for my dad so I can hear stories that I don't know about him that I would love to hear about even little things that he did. He would, he would do anything for anybody. He put himself after. Like if he had $5, he'd give it to you, and then later on be like, oh, oh well, I don't want these $5, what am I going to do? And just handle it on his own. And that's how I just remember my dad, just being such a strong man, like my protector. Because he would protect me from anything. But then he had the kindest heart that I could speak to him. 
He knew exactly what I felt. And I'm so blessed that these last two years, I got to have a lot of experience with my dad and learned so much about him because I'm like, oh my gosh, that's where I get it from. I never understood where I get like the family being together and like the animal thing and everything. It's like, I knew I always loved it, but you know, other people think different. And everybody has their own great things in life. Everybody does their own great everything. But he just made me feel like what I thought in my head was okay. Because some people don't understand that, but he did. And I'm so glad that I have that, that I have that to know that, Lindsay, it's okay. And you got to do what you got to do, you know? Whatever makes you happy in your heart. Just like my brother, he loves what he does because he loves building things and loves doing things. I wouldn't have it any other way. And he does what he does, and I love my brother more than anything. And he does what he loves, and that's what makes me happy. Is because growing up, I had animals, he had stuff he was building. I don't know. And that's just how it was. And I just, I'm just so, so thankful that he, that I, I, I got, I have that peace in me that what I'm doing is still right, even though to some people it might not feel right. But it is right. Because it's how you feel inside. And it's how you feel inside and what makes you feel good. And that's what makes me feel good. Even if I make $5 a day, I feel good at the end of the day. And I just, and he understood that. And I'm just so blessed that I got to learn so much about him and that how much he was where he got it from. Because I was like, oh my God, who does this? Like, who does of this? And, but he made, he understood. But he's my father, so I got it from him, obviously, because he understood. So I have a lot of my mother in me and then I have my father in me. So, but I just want to, I didn't have anything planned, but I knew. But I wanted to start it because I don't know. I know there's a lot of people here that have something to say, and I want them to feel comfortable to come up and say it because everything that is going to be said means so much to us about what he did for you or what he did. It, it means the world. Thank you guys for all being here for my day. She said uh, everything I was going to say. <laughs> I wouldn't be the man. I wouldn't even be a man today. One for my dad, you know. He's he was he was the he was the man, you know. Um, he made me get a bike, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to do things like, you know, like him, you know, and, uh, it's just, you know, I, I, he, call, he calls me three times a week, you know, he's like, hey, I got this friend, they want, my dad, what are you doing to yourself? And he's like, shut up. <laughs> Don't worry about it, shut up. And, uh, you know, the things that God did, you know, he would he would go to the extreme for everyone and then leave himself here, you know, and he wouldn't even care. He didn't do it, he didn't didn't matter to him, you know, what where he was. He could be in a gutter here, but as long as somebody had a ride and, and, and they got to here and there, he didn't care. And uh, he was he was a good dude, you know. Um miss him a lot. Not a whole lot to say, you know? Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> you coming up? I got a funny story. You got a funny story? <laughs> Come tell it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, he beat you. Oh, uh, yeah. This, Jimmy, you go first. <laughs> uh, I met John about 12 years ago. 
probably one of the scariest guys I've ever seen. <laughs> but on top of that, a man of very few words. But those very few words, he let you know how he felt. And most of the time it was, I love you. If you need anything, I'll be there for you. And even not being part of the family, he was very close to me and meant the world to me. I didn't um, <clears throat> And I can't believe I have to say this right now. I can't believe that I'm up here going through this right now. But being that man of very few words, I'll follow in his footsteps and just tell him that all of us here love him very much, and we, we miss him very much. I got a couple funny stories. Uh, John loved Lindsay and JP more than anything, and like, even when we'd, uh, we'd ride some places in the Jeep, I'd, I'd be the first one back and say, shotgun! <laughs> and John would always be the one to go, uh, no, no, JP called it. <laughs> <laughs> one time, not once. I'm like, man, something's up, man. I, I called it before, like, before we even left, leaving, walking out the door at Betty's. I didn't even already call, there's no way. And then if you ever mess with Lindsay, then you'd be in a, a big John death clutch. I've been thrown on the ground a few times. Like, Don't talk to her like that. Shit. And like, oh, and like arm broke or whatever. And then, uh, and Lindsay said the ways with animals the way he had it. I went over JP's and Lindsay's one night. And if people been over there, there's a big old German shepherd that lived two doors down. And I get out of the car and I make it like, and I just happen to look down the road and there's a German shepherd just standing, staring at me. So I run back to my car, I jump on the hood of it, I'm like, ah, because it's Chase, JP had the scooter, and he used to chase, who did, they chased you on yeah, the scooter, yeah. down the road, it's a big old German Shepherd, so I'm standing on, I'm sitting, laying on the hood of the car, I'm like, John, he comes outside, he's like, what are you doing, and he comes out, and he goes, I'm like, man, what are you doing, there's a big old German Shepherd, and he goes, he walks out, and it's like, like, ooh, there, there, he stares at me, he goes, Go home. And the dog put its tail down and ran back. <laughs> oh my god! And it was, I mean, it was so fun. And like, like he would do anything. For anything. It, like me and JP went to Denny's one time. And <laughs> Big up all over the seat. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you with us, Jimmy? I don't know. But he had his story. Yeah, he does. And uh, me and JP are sitting there. And it, you know, being the kind guy, as we're like, man, he had he had like a meeting. Some like somebody was in town, and like. Like, he was like, you guys act cool. So we're like, okay. So we're sitting there, me and JP used to crack up and just do whatever. You know, when you get ketchup, there's like water on top of it. So me and JP are like three booths down, and John and like the head manager guy are like down here. And I uh, I take the ketchup for the french fries. I'm like, <laughs> and the cap flies off, and ketchup flies all over the window, all over the bar. It's all over me. And I'm like, JP's eating salad, got salad coming out of his nose. He's up so hard. He's so hard. And, it's, and I end up, uh, then I'm like, oh man. So I'm like, all right, I go to clean up. I walk to the bathroom, I walk right past John's table. And the manager guy goes, he's bleeding. I'm like, oh man, I'm in for it now. I get in the bathroom, and here comes the big John death clutch. What are you doing? Stupid! And I, like, oh, I, said, I said, man, I don't know. I was, there's was water on the ketchup, man. I don't know. But I mean, it ended up being cool. There was just so many good times and good stories that, that we used to spend with John. And I'm going to miss him a lot. I mean, and uh, I don't know. That's all I got to say. Just a couple of funny stories to keep it, to keep it like, I don't know. We're here. Okay, I'm sitting down. <laughs> I met uh, JP through Davey about, I don't know, when we were like 16, 15, a while ago, and uh, like within no time at all, I was like part of the family, and uh, I even didn't have nowhere to live, 
a couple of years after that and come knocking on the door and asked JP and he asked his dad and that night I had somewhere to live. So I mean, John was like a, a dad to me and uh, he's definitely one of the coolest guys I've ever met. I went off in the Marines and I came back one time and he had a little Marine Corps pin on his, on his jacket and I thought that was like, that was pretty neat, you know, he's more of a dad than my dad was. Definitely gonna miss him. <laughs> Hi, my name is Terry, and I worked with John in 2006. I started working with him at Port Orange Denny's. At first, we were kind of like oil and water. Mm -hmm. But John taught me so much. John taught me that you didn't have to be black to be a friend. John taught me that in order to manage correctly, you can't be afraid to get dirty. John taught me that love is unconditional and and I'm a minister I should know that <laughs> but love is unconditional and I thank him for what the lessons that he has taught me I used to go into Denny's my daughter worked for him too Susan and I would sit in the booth, and he would come over to me in that little small voice he had sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, she, 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 she called me a bum. <laughs> <laughs> and then Susan would come over, Mom, he said that I was lazy. Yes. They acted like two kids <laughs> whenever those two were together. Whenever they were in one place, they acted like two kids. I had to laugh. But that's the type of person John was. And what I'm going to miss most about John is not only the quiet strength that he had, but I'm going to miss him bike week on that bike. I am. There was nobody like John. And I thank God for John. I went to work today and I sat there and wrote something about John, about your dad. So I absolutely loved and adored. It's easier for me to write this because I'll be all over the place. I'm so happy to have gotten to know John, my best friend, my soulmate, and my companion. He was the most important person in my life. John discovered at a young age what he would die for his homeland in Lebanon. The story he told me of things he did when he was a young man for his country and his beliefs gave me so much respect for him. He learned at a young age the importance of patriotism and honor. I met John when I was hired by Cheryl to be a manager at Denny's in Ormond. The first time I saw John was at the Port Orange Denny's when I was there to do my new hire paperwork. John came by a few times and talked to me, but was very shy in his conversations. I always remember the smile he gave me when he was standing there talking to me. It took about a good year before I finally got John's attention. We would talk a few times a week on the phone about our restaurants, but still he seemed to shy away from any other discussions. I tried to get his attention, but it didn't work. One day Dennis came to my restaurant, our MBM truck driver, and I always had a conversation about wanting to get to know John. 
So one day Dennis came to my restaurant and made a comment about something John said about me. I was kind of shocked at the statement, so I immediately got John on the phone and questioned what he said. He started to laugh, and in 15 minutes he was at my store, and we never looked back after that. I remember when we first fell in love, we would go out to dinner and stare in each other's eyes. John was a romantic. We would hold hands and just stare at each other nonstop. I had never felt so connected to another human being. John was extremely sensitive. He had no problem expressing his emotions, and emotions, especially towards me. He always told me how much he loved me and how beautiful I was, and of course he always yelled at me for wearing high heels. <laughs> we always made each other feel good inside. It wasn't perfect. We had our moments, but we would move on and remember how much we loved each other. We could talk about anything. We talked about our families, and especially how proud both of, both of us were always about our kids. He was a proud dad to Lindsay and JP. They were his heart and soul. John and I took many walks on the beach, drives in the car, trips to Disney, Cape Coral, Tampa, and rides on his bike. The one thing I can say about John, he was always very caring, loving, handsome, generous, outgoing, and a sensitive man. He was a father, a son, a friend, and my companion. But most importantly, John, you were you. As Jack Lemmon once said, death ends a life, not a relationship. I just want to say thank you to JP and Lindsay. You had a great dad. He had a heart of gold and was loved by a lot of people. I just want to thank you. years ago. I started working for him down in the Daytona Beach Shores. And at first I was scared of him. I thought he was the meanest man. <laughs> He'd call me and say, where are you? And I'm like, I'm not supposed to be there. He's like, yes, you are. And I'd rush down there and I wasn't on the schedule, but never said anything to him. <laughs> there was someone's birthday, every time there was a car going around, every time anybody needed anything, he would, he'd be the first person to give money for anything. Any time you needed him, he would be there for you no matter what. I had a flat tire one day, and he was at work, and he left, and he came and changed my tire. And he was there when I had my son. He was one of the first to go to pull my son. Yes, he was, wasn't he? And even though he's only three, he's already r rode on the Harley several times. <laughs> Every time you say John to him, he goes, he has a motorcycle. And that's how all the kids remember him. That's how everyone just remembers him, just driving around the corner on his bike with a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> he's going to be missed by everybody that knew him. And I'm just glad we all have a new angel now. John about six years ago at Lindsay's work and I remember the first time I saw him and he scared the crap out of me <laughs> but I just got home from the military and he walked up and shook my hand and had nothing but 
the most honorable things to say to me. A lot of times I would go up to Denny's to get food for me and Lindsay because we'd be hanging out watching TV and me and John would sit there and have a lot of long talks about the things that we went through. And I can honestly say that he is the most respectful man I've ever met in my life. Because no matter what, John always gave you the benefit of the doubt. No matter what you did, or anything like that, he never looked at you as if you were a bad person. He might be one of the scariest looking people ever, but... <laughs> He was the nicest man I've ever met in my life, hands down. I've seen that man bend over backwards for people, for his family, and people who aren't in his family. I remember the day when John bought that motorcycle, whenever I flew up to Harley Davidson store to bring him his checkbook so that he could pay for it. And how happy he was whenever he tore out of there on that thing. And it was like a race back to the house. And I was just, I'll just never forget him, and I can never thank him much for the talks that me and him have had and the things that he has helped me through. That's all I have to say. I think it's clear to everyone here that John was a scary man. <laughs> if he were here right now, he might sing along one of his favorite songs by Terry Jack's Seasons in the Sun, Goodbye Papa, It's Hard to Die. That would be a message to all of us in the room. We have expiration dates on these bodies, but we don't know when the time is up. And John's message through all of you tonight is very clear and very simple. Love, forgive, take care of, and do not waste time because time is something that you're unsure of. <coughs> so to conclude tonight, I'd like to read a famous passage. The Apostle Paul is talking about love. We started with kids talking about their idea of love. Here is what love really is. <coughs> And you'll see John in this. Paul says, love is patient. Love is kind, even if you look scary. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is never proud. Love is never rude. Love is never self-serving. It is not easily angered, and it never keeps record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. Here's the part that I think captures John. It's the last line. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. And love always perseveres. And then Paul closes the whole thing by saying three words. Love never dies. Bodies die. But love, which brought us in here, never dies. You can rest assured that even though the time is up for John's body, God is trying to catch him in heaven right now. Because he's alive and well, and we miss him, and we love him. And he's riding the streets of gold on his motorcycle. <laughs> Amen to that. Close your eyes. Let's close with prayer. Everyone in the room, just think about John, your favorite memory, your favorite part of his personality, bring it right up into your heart. Let the silence right now fill you with how much that man meant to you. As we conclude this service, may we use our time well. John, quite simply, we thank you for loving us enough to give us your best. Amen.
Um, wow, what a, what a great crowd. Okay. On behalf of uh, JP and, and Lindsay, uh, St. John's brother, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance tonight. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just so uh, we were going to ride the motorcycle out, but I guess we're not going to do that. So at this time, um, uh, we've cut all the cake up out, out back there on behalf of Donald. Uh, 